hosted by the Centre for the Study of Christian Origins and also SBCK Publishers. We're very pleased to have um, the publishers here with us. So we're extremely pleased to have with us today Professor uh, Tom Wright, who is the Professor of New Testament and Early Christianity just down the road at St Andrews. Tom has had an extremely illustrious career, including teaching New Testament at the University of Oxford, at McGill, and also a seven-year stint as Bishop of Durham from 2003 to 2010, so just before he came to St Andrews. Um, my colleague Larry has just told me that he had uh, ten honorary doctorates. When I just checked that with Tom, he said, actually, I think it's eleven. <laughs> so, um, I think we can tell from that and also from the turnout tonight just how um, eminent he is. He has, of course, got a whole string of books, not just academic heavyweight ones, but also uh, lighter ones too, designed for the person in the pew. And I think it's a really great contribution that he's an extremely articulate communicator and somebody who can write um, both kinds of books. We're here tonight, if I can just borrow, if I can lift <laughs> uh, Matt's copies. This, uh, we're here to celebrate Paul and the Faithfulness of God, um, two volumes, hefty books here, published by SBCK in 2013. Uh, what we're going to be doing is that Professor Wright is going to uh, give us a talk about the books, first of all. Then we're going to have a response from Dr. Matt Novenson, Edinburgh's answer to Tom Wright. <laughs> and then we'll open up the floor to discussion. Um, when we finish the main proceedings here, we'd like to invite you all down to the Rainy Hall, where we've got wine and nibbles, courtesy of SBCK. We've also got some copies of the books for sale at an extraordinary discount. Um, both volumes of the hardback you can get for £100, paperback only £40. And if you're very good, uh, Professor Wright will sign it for you. Um, so anyway, without any more ado then, can we welcome uh, Professor Tom Wright. <laughs> Thank you very much, Helen, and thank you all for being here. Let me switch my machine on and see if it's coming through. Is that, is that coming through? Am I coming? Okay, start again. Thank you very much, Helen. Thank you all for being here. Um, when I was bishop, somebody else had to do that for me, but I now remember I have to do it myself. Um, though that does put me in mind of my usual Episcopal Pauline joke about the bishop who um, said, plaintively, everywhere St. Paul went, there was a riot. Everywhere I go, they serve tea, which is... Um, Kind of a Church of England statement, I suppose, and maybe it applies north of the border, even without bishops, I wouldn't know. Um, happily, we've got, I think, wine and nibbles, not just tea after this, but I'm delighted to be here with you. Uh, but part of the origin of this book is the question, why was there a riot everywhere Paul went? Okay, it's Acts that says that, not Paul himself. However, when you read what Paul does say about his variegated life in 2 Corinthians 11, it looks as though there were a few riots in there somewhere, and that pretty well fits with Acts. And it's really because, and this is the genesis of the book proper, Paul lived at the edge of three, at least three worlds. The great world of Second Temple Judaism, the great world of Hellenistic Greek culture, and the new fangled world of the Roman Empire. Um, anyone standing on those fault lines was always going to find life was interesting. And Paul found it not just interesting, but more so because, of course, he had something different himself to bring to the party. Each one of those worlds, I think, shapes who Paul is and what he does in different ways. But what he brings to that is that he believes he is embodying and announcing and modelling and, in a sense, inventing something which I've called in the first chapter a world of difference. When we put Paul within his worlds, we see so many areas of overlap, but there's always a je ne sais quoi, and quite often something more than that, which makes us say, oh my goodness, this is different. And plotting that difference, it seems to me, is a fundamental historical task which inevitably generates the major theological questions. Somebody asked me last week in Durham when I was doing a similar event what I thought the series of books of which this is the fourth volume was actually all about. Was it a New Testament theology or what? 
I said, no, it is consciously standing at the line between a New Testament history and a New Testament theology. And I think that's a good place to be because I think New Testament theology is about the God of Israel and what the God of Israel does is to work within and through and upon history. And so we have to do both, and we have to do both all the time. And even though that's difficult and complicated, I don't see any way around that or out of it, nor would I want one. I start this book in an unusual place, and that is with the letter to Philemon. And as I explain in the preface, there's a personal reason for this. Philemon was the first bit of Paul, or indeed of anything in the Bible, I ever read. Uh, My sister and I were given coronation Bibles on June the 2nd, 1953, the day of the Queen's coronation. I was four and a half, she was five and a half, and I remember we went and sat on the nursery floor and leafed through this extraordinary chunky little book, King James, of course. Um, We were fairly daunted by most of it, but finally we came to this single-page book called, I don't think we even knew how to pronounce it, Philemon or whatever it was. I had only just learned to read at at the time, and Um, I wasn't ready for Romans, let alone (laughs) (laughs) Jeremiah or whatever, but I began with Philemon. I've always had a soft spot for it ever since. So when I was thinking about this book, I was thinking not just let's find a quirky place to start, but actually when you put the letter to Philemon in front of you, knowing what we know about the ancient world of Paul's day, and when you actually think into what's going on, you already find a world of difference. And I actually tried it as an experiment this last year with my undergraduates in St Andrews. I began the first week of their introduction to Paul by giving them Philemon and Pliny's letter to Sabinianus, which is both very similar and very different. Um, The beginning of their introduction to Paul was to say, what's the same and what's different and why? And that's how we start. Because... Like many people, I have argued throughout this book that Paul is basically about reconciliation. But it isn't just reconciliation between humans and God, though it is, of course, that, and that remains vital. It's reconciliation between people of all sorts and shapes and sizes, including some of the biggest leaps possible in the ancient world, and in this case, between the world of free and the world of slave. And Paul doesn't just say, come on, Philemon, you you know we ought to... Uh, get into some 19th century morality, you know you ought to free your slaves now. Life just isn't like that in the ancient world. He does something much more subtle. He invites Philemon to understand who he is in terms of this figure he calls Christos and of what it means to be en Christo and all the good that is in us that leads us into Christ, is Christon. And Paul stands there in the middle of this very tense situation and if you don't think it's a tense situation, you haven't understood how the ancient world works, and reaches out with one arm and says, here is Onesimus, he's my son. I've had a son in prison, and here he is. He's my very heart. And then he reaches out the other arm to Philemon and says, by the way, remember, you owe me your very life, and if he's offended you in any way, put it down on my account. Paul is mod- He doesn't mention the cross of Jesus in that letter. He simply does it. He stands there in the middle and says, reconciliation. And when, and I think it's written around the same time, when we find in 2 Corinthians 5, Paul talking about uh, himself as being entrusted with the ministry of reconciliation, I think Paul knows that if it's real, it's local. It's, It's no good just to talk grandly about reconciliation unless when faced with this situation or the one in Philippi with Euodia and Syntyche or whoever it is, It's actually got to happen on the ground. And to anticipate a question which people often ask at such sessions, if Paul was here today, what would he have to say to us? The easy answer is, and I think it's true, he would be utterly horrified by our collusion with radical disunity in the church. He just would not be able to understand, not only that it's happened, but that we're not too bothered about it. And we've all got used to it. Anyway, that's anticipating all sorts of things. So in part one of the book... The book has four parts, and part one, we go up step by step through Paul's different worlds. After the introduction, Paul's Jewish world, Paul's Greek philosophical world, the religious world of Paul's day, which spans uh, spans Greek and Roman, and then the political world of Paul's day. And I spend some time laying that out because, in my experience, not a lot of students coming to Paul know that stuff ahead of time, and I wanted to try to put some stuff on the table so we get a, a fairly thick description 
of this multi-layered world that Paul lives in. And among the thousands of things that I find fascinating in all of that are the narratives. Because in the Jewish world, so many of the Jews of Paul's day, as Josephus tells us, believed that they were living in a narrative which was going somewhere, which was reaching a climax, a conclusion of some sort. Um, we see that in the way they relive the narrative of the end of Deuteronomy, which, as Josephus says, we see it in the way that what drove them to war in the 50s and 60s, Josephus says, was an oracle in their scriptures which said that at that time a world ruler would arise from Judea. I think that's a reference to Daniel, and I think what you see in the Jewish world is people living on Daniel and Deuteronomy particularly, but other things as well, and saying we are part of a story which is going somewhere. And Paul believes that it got there with Jesus. Although, when it got there, it was such a shock and a surprise that nobody had anticipated it. And it was anything other than, he says, to ward off possible attacks from certain quarters, anything other than a smooth progress up to the light. Jewish Heilsgeschichte was never like that. It was never just a, a steady crescendo and now we've got there. It was always a murky, dark story full of twists and turns and tragedies into which, the, from Paul's point of view, the new revelation of Jesus as Israel's Messiah, crucified and risen, burst like people said about Karl Barth's Romans, like a, um, a bomb falling on the playground of the theologians. That's how Paul saw. And yet, and yet, <coughs> Paul, looking back at Jesus and his death and resurrection, said, if you like, God has acted startlingly, shockingly, unexpectedly, scandalously, as he always said he would. And Paul looks right back and sees in Genesis, in Deuteronomy, in the Psalms, in Isaiah, in Jeremiah, in Ezekiel, oh my goodness, that's where it was all going. And somehow, though this is very difficult for us today, because we lurch from a sort of steady state, a Hegelian progress thing, to a, a, a kind of Nietzschean apocalypse or whatever, we, we go to and fro on that. Paul manages to hold these two together. This is, in fact, what God had said he would do, but it's shocking and scandalous and has blown the whole world apart as far as we're concerned. Now, at the same time, interestingly, and I keep talking to Roman historians about this, and I haven't found any of them who tell me that anyone's done a PhD on this yet. In the age of Augustus, there is this extraordinary parallel narrative which says that for 800 years, Rome has had this great story from the founding, either by Aeneas or by Romulus and Remus, or somehow both. They managed to cope with both of those. And then the great story of Rome goes on and on and on as a republic, a proud republic. But now it has arrived at its great unexpected climax because we have the Son of God, the Saviour, the one who's brought justice and peace to the world, the one who now rules the world and who asks for your faithful allegiance and, by the way, your taxes. And he's called Augustus. And then it's called Tiberius or whoever. In other words, you have a kind of a parallel Heilsgeschichte. And this is the more interesting in that obviously the Jews didn't get it from the Romans because this was a complete novum with Virgil and Ovid and Livy and Horace and no doubt others as well. And I just took some of my students to the um, uh, Augustus exhibition in Rome a few weekends ago and it's moving to Paris fairly soon. If you haven't seen it, do go to Paris and see it um, because you can see how the iconography of the Roman Empire instantiated this narrative which has now arrived at the place it was going to. Paul lived in a world where he inherited the great Jewish story, which had exploded into a whole new form with Jesus, but where he was articulating that in an imperial world which had exploded into new shape with Augustus and his successors. Anyway, so I go up, like a stepladder, going up those chapters in part one, which brings us to the two middle bits of the book, Paul's worldview and Paul's theology. When I went to Princeton on sabbatical in 2009, which was in order to write this book or to start writing this book, um, so I didn't manage to finish it quite when I was there, which is why I moved up here, etc., etc. That's a whole other story. One of the big questions that I had in mind was to do with the symbols of Paul's world. Paul came from the Jewish world in which you are marked out as a Jew, particularly in the diaspora, by the fact that you kept the food laws, more or less, and there's a negotiation about how that worked. You kept the Sabbath. Uh, you uh, thought about going to the temple, and maybe you did make pilgrimages there, but at least the temple was the ultimate focus of, 
of, of who you really were. Uh, you circumcised your male children, and basically you, you lived that particular life. You married within the family, endogamy, etc. These were the cultural symbols which said, we are the people of God. Now, it's clear from Galatians on that for Paul the Apostle, as opposed to Saul of Tarsus, all that has somehow been taken away, transmigrated into something else, transformed. However you're going to say it, it's difficult to say that because you get into all sorts of other theological difficulties. But it's all, Paul says you don't, if you're a Gentile Christian, you don't have to be circumcised, you don't have to keep the food laws, you don't have to keep Shabbat, etc., etc. And, 1 Corinthians, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, and the church as a whole is a temple. What's he saying? This cannot just be a random metaphor for a devout first century Jew. So if the symbols have all been transferred in some ways, what are the symbols? What is the symbol of the new worldview? The thing which says this is who we are. The thing you can actually see on the street. And the answer that I've given in, this, in chapter 6, at the beginning of part 2 of the book, is that it's the church itself which is the central symbol of the worldview. The church itself as the united and holy community. Now, there's something about that holiness which remains robustly Jewish, because for Paul, and Paul of Fredrickson has made this argument well in various places, for, for, for Paul the Apostle, as for Saul of Tarsus, you do not worship idols, you maintain the, the, the model of genuine humanness which is there in Torah, only you now believe that you're given this genuine humanness by a different route. And because you are renewed in knowledge according to the image of the Creator, you do not worship idols. And you behave in the genuinely human way and not in the way that goes with idolatry. So there's a very deep sense in which Paul believes that his Jewishness is fulfilled. It's not abandoned, certainly not. But the church itself, this extraordinary community which has Philemon and Onesimus side by side, which has male and female sharing equally in this community, which comes particularly to, to draw together Jews and Gentiles. This, you know, Caesar would have loved to have been able to generate a community of unity like that, and he couldn't. It was a, it was a flattened unity, rather like some of the um, different empires of the 20th century have had a flattened down unity. But we have this vibrant, differentiated unity within Paul's vision of the church. The church itself is, I think, the central symbol. But then, the way that I've done worldviews over the years, and by the way, I wasn't sure if Oliver Donovan was going to be here tonight. Um, both sorry he isn't and rather glad he isn't, because um, he, he has been reading the book and has pushed back very hard at me on worldview, and that's a, a whole conversation which he and I are trying to have, um, but perhaps not for tonight. But the way that I've analysed worldviews in my other books includes not only symbols but also particularly stories. Now, I know that narrative theology has been faddish and that people have gone overboard in translating everything into narrative. Actually, the Jewish world is a fundamentally narratival world. Yes, you've got proverbs. Yes, you've got things that don't automatically translate. But the main drift of it, however you organize the, 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 the Hebrew and Aramaic canon, the main drift of it is a narrative. As Wittgenstein said, it's a narrative in search of an ending. It's like a, like a body looking for a head. Wittgenstein thought that the Gospels were offering themselves as the head for that narrative, interestingly. And, and in order to give some light relief in chapter 7, I've used Midsummer Night's Dream as a kind of a, a way in to show how different narratives can work together and how different things happen according to which bit of the narrative. You know how Midsummer Night's Dream works. You've got um, the, the, the king, Theseus, who's, who's going to marry Hippolyta. Now fair Hippolyta, our nuptial hour, draws on a pace. Four happy days bring in another moon, but only thinks how slow this old moon wanes, etc., etc. The moon is hugely important. The moon plays a different role at each stage of the narrative. The next bit, you get the star-crossed lovers, and they all go off to the wood and get muddled. And then you get the fairy king and queen, often played by the same as the original king and queen. And then finally, in the middle of it all, when everyone is having a crazy time, you get the rude mechanicals practicing Pyramus and Thisbe. And that waits until the very end, and finally you get Pyramus and Thisbe, which is a mini Romeo and Juliet, which Shakespeare was writing at the same time. And all the things that might have gone horribly wrong with all the other narratives are finally dealt with horribly, tragically. But 
very amusing in that play. And the play ends with Theseus saying, Moonshine and lion are left to bury the dead. The moon plays... Now, this is not an exact analogy, but I've argued in the book that what you have in Paul is a sense of these different narratives, God and creation, God and humankind, God and Israel, God and Jesus. And now, the new stories of the church. And there are some elements which come in almost all of those narratives, particularly the Jewish law. People have debated forever did Paul think the Jewish law was a good thing, now fulfilled, or a bad thing, now abolished? I got stick for saying from somebody, I forget who, saying that for Luther it was a bad thing, now abolished, and for Calvin it was a good thing, now fulfilled. Um, broadly, in the Lutheran tradition and in the Calvinist tradition, that's how it played out, even though, of course, if you look up the collected works of Martin Luther, you can prove actually almost anything, because he said rather a lot of things. <laughs> Um, but actually the, the law, the nomos, plays different roles according to which level of the narrative you're in. You can go through Romans, Galatians, Corinthians, Philippians, and see how that works, whether it's the moon which is uh, the nuptial hour or whether it's the moon which is left to bury the dead. The, 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 that, that's not an inconsistency. Shakespeare isn't being illogical. This is how narratives work. Narratives work, and this is how they work for Paul. So... Part two of the book is about Paul's worldview, and there's much more I can't say that, that for tonight there. But then we get the transition in the middle of the book between the two printed volumes. What, what, what among my sorrows about this are that, that actually it would have been nice if they'd been the same size, but I've, I'd have had to expand part two considerably to get it up to the same size as, as, um, as, as the second volume. Never mind. But, but here's, the, here's the trick. This is what the book is basically about. And if any of you are thinking of writing reviews, no names, no pack drill, this is actually what the book is about. <laughs> is the, uh, um, uh, how is that worldview going to stand up? Here is this project of a new community, united, holy, living in a highly contested and complicated pagan environment with all the, the, the energy of the Jewish roots, but all the problems of the Gentile context. Paul's answer to that question is not simply, you'll do what I tell you and somehow we'll hold it together, but you will learn to do theology. You will learn to do theology. What does he mean by that? He says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what is God's will. Transformed by the renewing of the mind, Romans 12, 2. Or in 1 Corinthians 14, when he says, when it comes to evil, I want you still to be babies, but when it comes to thinking, you're to be grown-ups. Now, what did Paul do? You know that saying, give someone a fish and you feed them uh, for a day, teach someone to fish and you feed them for life. For Paul... Give someone a doctrine and you'll help them for the next day or week with the particular issue that they're facing. Teach someone to think Christianly and you will enable them to go on doing that and to go on. What does it mean to think Christianly? For Paul, it means to think en Christo. We have the mind of Christ, he says, at the end of 1 Corinthians 2. Extraordinary claim. And as I've pondered this, it seems to me what Paul is longing to see is communities who are formed of people, not just a few teachers, but of the whole community, who are wrestling with the scriptures, wrestling in prayer, wrestling with the issues of their day, but learning to do so en Christo and in the power of the Spirit. And he will give them the guide rails, the guidelines. But as I've argued in a, a book a few years ago about virtue, as with ethics, so with thinking. It's not enough to give lots and lots and lots of rules. What you have to do is to teach people how to grow up, how to mature, so that then, okay, there are guidelines, there are certain very clear things, but so that they will inhabit those things and grow up into them. And so how are we going to do Paul's theology? Now, here's another, in a sense, innovation in this book. It's one I've been working up to for a long time. Because so many books on Pauline theology assume that the structure of Pauline theology is basically that of the Reformation Confessions, where the whole emphasis is on soteriology. That is to say, ever since the Middle Ages, the big question was, 
do we go to heaven, do we go to hell, will we do time in purgatory, how will all that work, um, what's the mechanism by, by which all that happens. So people have lined it up, God, man, always was man in the older text, sin, salvation, Christ, the cross, whatever. And then, if you were lucky, somewhere about sort of chapter 17, there might be a little chapter on the church and there might be a little chapter on ethics, carefully sanitized away at the back, lest it leak out and infect the nice doctrine of justification that you've got earlier on. Um, so you see, that's just radically untrue to the way Paul's mind worked. And so as I ponder this, this is, this is, I say, goes back some time in my own work. I went back to some of the writers who've written about Jewish theology, like Solomon Schechter, aspects of rabbinic theology. Schechter, who famously said that the rabbis had many faults, but consistency was not among them. <laughs> <laughs> and, and in books like that, what you get is again and again a substantial threefold structure monotheism, election, eschatology. One God, one people of God, one future for God's world. You know, Jews don't characteristically do theology in the sense that the church has done, because actually I think the historical reason for that is that the church needed to do, for, for, the, for the good Pauline reasons. This is who we are. We are the people who believe, through clenched teeth sometimes and with bated breath, in this God who has been freshly revealed to us, whereas the Jews have the Torah and they don't have the same impetus towards theology as a discipline. But if you ask Jews, what is it you basically believe? One God, absolutely central. And then the people of God, of course. But if there is one God and Israel is his people, then you're going to have to have an eschatology because it sure doesn't look as though there is one God and Israel is his people right now. That's how it's always worked. Monotheism plus election equals a big question mark, and the way through the question mark is eschatology, something to do with God's future. And so uh, I took a deep breath and decided to try to see what would happen if we ran through Paul's thinking, teaching, in terms of those three topics, and again and again and again. And of course I would say this, wouldn't I? I think the experiment works. But what does monotheism mean? A thousand debates about that, of course, at the moment. I like to go back, not least, to Akiba, the great rabbi who hailed Bar Kokhba as Messiah. I was teaching in an undergraduate class a couple of years ago, and I mentioned something about the Bar Kokhba revolt, 132 to 135 AD, after, the, uh, after Hadrian had planned either to um, ban circumcision or to build a pagan city, the site of Jerusalem, or possibly, probably both. Um, you get the Bar Kokhba revolt, and I discovered the undergraduates had never even heard of it. And the, actually, I think the Bar Kokhba revolt is hugely important for understanding how Jewish movements might well be thinking throughout that period. Anyway, when the revolt is over and the Romans have, have killed Bar Kokhba, they are torturing Akiba to death by combing his flesh with steel combs. And as that is happening, according to rabbinic legend, and there's two or three different variants on this, he is praying the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And the rabbinic way of referring to that is he is taking upon himself the yoke of the kingdom, which is interesting in itself. His disciples say to him, as he is praying this prayer, Rabbi, how can you be praying this prayer in these circumstances? And he says, all my life I have loved him with my heart and my mind and my strength. And I have wondered what it would mean to love him with my life. And now that I have the opportunity, shall I not take it? And he dies with the word Echad. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. And he dies with one. That's monotheism. Take it back to Second Maccabees 7. Take it back to all sorts of passages. We have this one God. The pagans who have these many gods are out to get us. And we are just going to stand here. And even if they kill us, that's what mon monotheism is not a theory. It's not a philosophical idea about um, who this one God might be. It's an utter determination to say that there is one God and this world belongs to him and the pagan gods are no goods. They're, they're, they're not on the map. Interestingly, one of the biggest pushbacks that I've had to this book since it came out is not from where I'd expected, but from... Um, people who are trying to be sort of Christian Unitarians who say, well, 
there is one God for Jews, therefore you can't say that in any sense Jesus is part of the being of the one God. And I've said, show me one pre-Christian Jewish text where monotheism is about an inner analysis of the being of the being of the one God. And of course, as far as I'm aware, they can't. So I start off with monotheism, and I start off with Akibar, and I say, okay, Paul is that kind of a Jew. Paul is a deeply serious, kingdom-orientated, uh, Shema-praying, monotheistic Jew. And what do we find? We find that Paul's monotheism has been radically revised around and in and through Jesus and the Spirit. Now, there's many different ways of doing that. I must pay tribute to Larry Hurtado, who's sitting in the front here, who actually revolutionized this whole field with his book of 11 years ago, um, Lord Jesus Christ, and we all pay homage to that and are grateful for it. I have tried to explore, as well as that, and in dialogue with that, another theme which seems to me to come up very strongly in several uh, biblical texts and in Second Temple texts, which is the narrative about Israel's God returning to Zion, Israel's God coming back. Isaiah 40 says that he will come back. Um, Isaiah 52 says, Your watchmen lift up their voices and shout for joy because they see him coming back. And at no point in the Second Temple period does anyone say it's happened. The Shekinah, as one of the much later rabbis said, was absent from the Second Temple. I think Paul plugs into that motif of the return of Yahweh to Zion. Not only to talk about Jesus, which he does, and all those texts which use Kyrios, Lord, from the Old Testament, uh, where it's Yahweh passages in the Old Testament and he ascribes it to Jesus, but also for the Spirit, because one of the things that you, you get with the return of Yahweh to Zion is the idea of a new exodus. And what do you find at the exodus? You find that the pillar of cloud by day and fire by night lead the people to their inheritance, to their promised land. When Paul retells that story in Romans 8 and Galatians 4, it is the Spirit who does what, in the Ur text, as it were, Yahweh himself does. You cannot get, I think, a higher pneumatology than that. You know, people often used to say, well, the early Christians may have got Jesus more or less sussed, but it took four centuries before they figured out the Spirit. I think what it took four centuries for was for philosophically minded um, uh, learned fathers to catch up with what Paul had actually said in Jewish language right from day one. Anyway, so that's uh, chapter nine, the beginning of the long part three of the book, Paul's theology, which generates a vision of the problem of evil. What you think about the problem of evil is the reflex, as it were, of what you think about who God is. And I believe, you know, there's a debate. Ed Sanders said Paul started with the solution and worked back to the plight over against the Reformation theologians who said that Paul started with the plight of sin and then here was Jesus, that was the solution. I think every first century Jew, except conceivably Caiaphas, so I suspect he probably thought there was a plight too, um, every first century Jew knew there was a problem, a major problem. Things weren't right. What I think happened with the gospel was that the death and resurrection of Jesus and the gift of the Spirit made Paul realize that the plight was deeper and different from what he'd imagined. But what is the solution to the plight? In Jewish theology, the solution to the plight is always the call of God's people. Abraham, go and do this, that, the other, and in you and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. One of the 3rd or 4th century AD rabbis says it like this, that God said on creation, I will make Adam first, and if he goes wrong, I'll send Abraham to sort it all out. It's in Genesis Rabbi, a commentary on Genesis 15. I think that's a substantially Pauline insight as well. And I think Paul sees the call of Abraham and then the checkered career of Abraham's family as the paradoxical means of the God who made Adam first sorting it all out so that it's within election the choice of the people of God chapter 10 in my book that we get basically soteriology and to cut to the chase this too is focused on Jesus and the spirit Jesus as Messiah as the one who does what Israel was called to do but failed to do Jesus as the faithful Messiah faithful unto death obedient unto death Jesus as the one, therefore, in whom all the promises of God find their yes. But then the Spirit as the one who, through the gospel, generates the faith 
which is the answer to, or the, 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 the thing that meshes with, the faithfulness of the Messiah, which is the embodiment of the faithfulness of God. I think that in chapter 10, by structuring it like that, here's the promise, here's election, here is the Messiah, here's the Spirit, I think there is there a framework for dealing with the doctrine of justification in a way which actually makes sense, holds water, keeps all the bits of the puzzle on the table, and we can talk about that later if you want. All sorts of results in terms of different Pauline debates, as you can imagine. So then, chapter 11 is on eschatology. Somebody said to me, I see that the key section of your book is chapters 9 to 11. Were you modelling the book on the letter to the Romans? And I said, uh, no, that was an accident because actually chapter 4 was a latecomer. I wasn't intending to do that. Um, and it snuck in, bumping all the others along one, as it were, thereafter. That was just about a year ago that happened. So no, this was an accident. But anyway... And chapter 11 is on eschatology, where I basically do the same. Here is the Jewish vision of the end. The day of Yahweh becomes the day of the Lord Jesus, and so on. Resurrection both has already happened in Jesus and will happen to all his people at the end, and so on and so on. Which leaves two big questions which have to be dealt with within the framework of eschatology. One, if God has done what he's done in Jesus and by the Spirit, how come we are still sinful? How come Jesus' people, once they've been baptized and come to faith, aren't automatically sinless. And Paul's answer is in what we call his ethics. And what I have argued is a new form of virtue ethic, that God wants people, not puppets. Therefore, part of the deal, part of the theology, is that as you think this stuff through, you have to take responsibility for it. And that cannot happen overnight. And the other part that is left over, as it were, is the question of Israel. The question, if you like, of Romans 9 to 11. And again, Paul argues that it isn't actually an accident that most Jews have failed to believe the gospel. But how he grapples with that is, of course, one of the toughest and most fascinating passages anywhere in any theology known to me. And I've spent quite a bit of time trying to work that out. So that's how the central bit of the book works. Paul's worldview can only stay in position if the community is struggling in prayer, in being soaked in the scripture, to wrestle with the big issues, to see how they fit together, and to live accordingly. So Paul basically wants the church to grow up in its thinking, and here is the theological framework by which it's supposed to do that. So then... Part four of the book, I come, as it were, back down the ladder. Paul, and with this Paul that we've now seen, what happens when we put this Paul into the Roman Empire, into the world of ancient religion, into the world of first century philosophy, and into the very turbulent first century world of Judaism? And how do we then round it off? With Paul and politics, there is, of course, again, a big fad that's been running now for about 20 years, which basically says, for Paul, Jesus is Lord, and so Caesar isn't. I have cheerfully taken part in that. It's kind of funny. I remember when I first really started to get into this stuff was when I had just moved into um, Three Little Cloister in Dean's Yard by Westminster Abbey, looking across the street to the House of Lords and thinking, yeah, this is exactly the right time to be starting to say Jesus is Lord, so Caesar isn't. And I've spent the last ten years um, working that out existentially as well as exegetically. Um, but there's been quite a lot of pushback, particularly in America, because often this has been grossly, in my view, overstated by people who have a rather simplistic view that really all Paul is about is just thumbing his nose at Caesar. And life is much more interesting and complicated than that. And so in chapter 12 of this book, I've tried to navigate that with a bit more subtlety than I had had space to do before, engaging in debate with my good friend down the road in Durham, John Barclay, um, who has actually critiqued me on that. So if you're interested in Paul and politics, that's where it's landing for me at the moment. Paul and religion is an interesting one because within the Protestant churches it's often been said that, of course, what you have with Paul is, is, is not religion because religion means temples and sacrifices and priests and all that. And clearly Paul's communities didn't have that. If you want to know what Paul was really like, look either into the political sphere or into the philosophical sphere. In fact, I've often said that if you were inventing a university without a theology department and wondered where you should be teaching Paul, 
Uh, certainly not in a department of religion, much better in politics or philosophy, or classics or whatever. That, that's a slight overstatement, though, because in the first century, religion didn't mean what that word has come to mean since the Enlightenment. In the first century, religion is what happens when here we are, we're in a, a small city-state, and we've got its members who we can all see and who we know, but there are other members who are invisible and they're called the gods. And there are some local ones and there are some big ones and there are some little ones. But they're part of this community as well and they're quite powerful. And they can sometimes be cranky and awkward. So to keep them on side, there's stuff we do, particularly sacrifices. Especially when important things like a battle or a, a major event is taking place. So we do festivals, we do all sorts of rituals, we all, which binds the community together. And one of the likely derivations of the Latin word religio is the idea of binding a community. Now, did Paul do that? Well, he didn't have temples, he didn't have animal sacrifices, but he did believe in this extraordinary community which was bound together, and among the symbols of the binding together were these extraordinary things, baptism and the Eucharist. It looks as though, just as Paul, I think, has a theory of virtue which is both like and radically unlike what you get in Aristotle. So I think some people, if they really got to know Paul, would say, well, in a sense, you have got a sort of religion. It's just you don't do most of the things that we do. No, that's been done. Jesus did that. Well, how does that work? So chapter 13 is, is about that. And then chapter 14 is about Paul and philosophy. And... Uh, there's been a huge push recently in terms of Paul and Stoicism, trying to locate Paul within the Stoic world, and I have tried to argue over against that, that actually Paul's Jewish worldview rethought around Jesus and the Spirit generates a new center from which the great philosophical questions of antiquity could be addressed. With Paul's theology of resurrection, you get a theology of new creation. And with the theology of new creation, you have a new vision of the cosmos, of everything that is, and a new vision of what it means to know things. The ancient philosophers talked about physics, what there is, ethics, how you behave, and logic, um, which divides differently, but um, uh, basically how we know stuff. That's Diogenes Laertius' analysis of it anyway. Physics, ethics, and logic. I think Paul has a new physics. I think he has a new ethic. I think he has a new logic. Not that they're separate from what everyone else does, because the resurrection is not about a different creation ex vetere, but a new creation, uh, sorry, a different creation uh, ex, uh, 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 ex nihilo, but a new creation ex vetere, out of the old one. This is the renewal of God's cosmos. And the great philosophical questions, we can see Paul beginning to address them in implicit dialogue. I have this fantasy about Paul meeting Seneca when they are both in Rome, knowing that Nero is likely to order their death fairly soon. There was a later fictitious correspondence, but if somebody wanted to write a novel, that would be a great one to write. What did they talk about when they got together? And then Paul and Judaism. I'm not going to try to say much about that now. It's a huge challenge on several fronts about you know, at the time, so many different Jewish communities were struggling with self-definition. What does it mean to be loyal members of God's people? Paul belongs on that map, but with some radical differences. How we navigate that, how we line it up, Paul's use of scripture, etc. Huge and interesting and important questions. Brings back to the end. Reconciliation. Not just God and humans, not just humans and humans, but history and religion and philosophy and theology, community... For Paul, these are not what they've so often been in theological teaching. Well, Paul has these theological things, and then, yeah, there's some spin-offs here and there for philosophy or politics or whatever. No, it's all part of a single fabric. C.S. Lewis says in his preface to Paradise Lost that one of the hard things for us, reading three and a half centuries after, or whenever it is, after Milton, is that there were some things which, for Milton, were absolutely all part of the same single idea which present themselves to us in the 20th or 21st century as four, five, or six quite different ideas. And somehow we have to think our way back, even to get back to Milton. Now, when we think back to Paul 2,000 years ago, somehow we have to see that things which the Enlightenment world has split up into quite separate departments, often literally university departments, are actually part of the same thing. And Paul's vision, then, is a vision of unity... <coughs> where God is all in all. 
And that vision in 1 Corinthians 15 of God's eventual purpose, as he says in Ephesians, that's trailing a coat if you like, that God's purpose was to sum up all things in heaven and on earth and Christo. I sometimes think if the reformers had made Ephesians rather than Galatians and Romans their main texts, then the entire history of the Western world would have been different because in Ephesians 1.10 you have that vision of all things being united. In Ephesians 2 you have the vision of Jew and Gentile coming together and so on and so on. In Ephesians 3 you have the vision that if the church was like that, it would be calling time on the principalities and powers. And the church hasn't, by and large, done that. And I think if Paul was here, was here, he'd say no, because you didn't get the basic message. And so it all comes down then, as with monotheism itself, to theology and prayer. I end with that, end the book, and I'm going to end this. Because at the heart of Paul's re revisioned monotheism, I think we find 1 Corinthians 8, 6, where Paul takes the Shema... And he doesn't bolt Jesus on from the outside. He discovers Jesus at the heart of it. And that's not just a saying stuck at the front of a, an argument about something else. We can see through 1 Corinthians 8 and then particularly 10, it's all part of the same argument, that he's exploring what it means to be monotheists, but monotheists of this Christological sort. So he says, for us there is one God the Father, one God the Father from whom are all things and we to him one Lord Jesus Christ through whom are all things and we through him and I have this and again it's historical fantasy of imagination of Paul like Akiba waiting for the Roman executioner it would be kinder for Paul a sword rather than steel combs but I like to think that Paul, knowing that the hour had come, would be praying like Akiba was, the Shema. Only for Paul, it wouldn't be exactly the same because it would have Jesus at the heart of it, and that too would be part of the point. Theology becomes prayer. Prayer becomes theology. As George Herbert said, something understood. Thank you. pleasure for me to give a brief response to Professor Wright's lecture today, and I mean that uh, not just in the customary platitudinous sense, there's nothing wrong with that sense, but uh, as it happens, one of the very first works of biblical scholarship that I ever read was Wright's The New Testament and the People of God, which was the first volume of the series of which uh, this book, Paul and the Faithfulness of God, is volume four. This was the 1990s, and I was an undergraduate philosophy student at the time uh, when a friend lent me a copy of that uh, former book, saying something to the effect of, this is a really interesting book. You probably have not read anything like it. Uh, and indeed, I had not read uh, anything quite like it. But Wright's characteristically learned uh, and creative way of doing New Testament exegesis was an early example for me of the exciting possibilities that lay open in the ostensibly uh, dusty, antiquarian field of biblical studies. So undergraduate students, take note. I have therefore read each subsequent volume uh, in this series with great interest, and none more so than this latest volume, which lies closest to my own area of research. Now how to respond in 10 minutes to a book of some 1,600 pages? Well, since I have just now broached the subject, it may be worthwhile to say a word about the size of the book, since this is a feature that has apparently attracted some attention. One of my students told me that uh, somewhere on the internet, a wag has suggested that Wright's new book poses a serious threat to the health and well-being of the churches 
in as much as if the book were to be dropped from a church balcony uh, of average height and strike an adult human of average bone structure, then it would effect certain grave injury and possible death. <laughs> uh, or something to that effect. Now, that's, this is a reasonably funny joke, uh, but it's not a substantial criticism of the book. <laughs> I've heard colleagues complain, and uh, indeed I myself have complained, that the books in our field seem perhaps to be growing longer, on average, year by year. And the good people from SBCK could perhaps confirm or disconfirm uh, this speculation for us. There are certainly scholars from whose pens I could not bring myself to read 1,600 pages. <laughs> but there are other scholars who write artful prose and whose contributions have proven genuinely important, and Wright has a very strong claim to both of these distinctions. According to the late Bishop Stephen Neal, in an industry standard history of New Testament research, of which our guest of honor is the co-author, uh, the published oeuvre of the great German polynist Ferdinand Christian Bauer ran to some 16,000 pages. Now, I confess that I have not been able to count meticulously the pages of work documented in Professor Wright's formidable CV, but by my rough estimate, at least, he has not yet passed that mark. If I'm <laughs> mistaken, he can correct me. But at any rate, if... If students in Tübingen in the mid-19th century, who had not even the aid of the incandescent light bulb, could manage to, to read and to sit exams on the whole of the Bauer corpus, then surely students in St. Andrews or in Edinburgh or elsewhere, with their iPads and Kindles and other space-age reading machines, can manage 1,600 pages from one of the great Pauline exegetes of our day. Postgraduate students take note. <laughs> now, because we typically comprehend things we do not know by comparing them with things we do know, it may be helpful to think of this book in terms of an analogy. I note that Daniel Boyarin has hailed Paul and the faithfulness of God as the bultman for our age, a reference, I take it, to the great mid-20th century theology of the New Testament of Rudolf Bultmann, longtime professor of the New Testament in Marburg. The comparison is apt and in more than a few respects. <clears throat> Wright, like Bultmann, undertakes to give a comprehensive account of Pauline theology, and furthermore, to situate that account in a particular historical narrative of Christian origins. In our present cultural moment, it is hard to imagine any work of critical New Testament scholarship having a popular impact equal to Bultmann's, but if any contemporary book could make such a claim, then I reckon it would be Professor Wright's. Certainly, Paul and the Faithfulness of God will become a standard point of reference in subsequent research on Pauline theology, and rightly so. From another angle, Wright's project actually looks very unlike Bultmann's, especially with respect to the strong dogmatic stamp of the latter. So some of you will know Bultmann's famous rubric of humanity prior to faith, <coughs> humanity after faith, and so on. Wright has given us a theology, to be sure, but a theology woven tightly into a schematic historical narrative. And in this respect, Wright's grand project, uh, represented in this series, actually bears a closer resemblance, I think, to the great pre-World War I syntheses, such as Adolf von Harnack's Mission and Expansion of Christianity in the first three centuries, or Emil Schurer's History of the Jewish People in the Time of Jesus Christ. Now, to my mind, this bibliographical resemblance is a virtue, and other readers may or may not agree. The analogy to Bultmann is illuminating in another way as well. Uh, Robert Morgan once perceptively noted that, uh, about Bultmann that he had the most remarkable capacity never to change his mind. <laughs> now, if we consider Professor Wright's several major contributions to Pauline studies over the last three decades, especially, but by no means only, the climax of the covenants, 1991, what St. Paul really said, 1997, and Paul in Fresh Perspective, 2005, we might be excused for asking whether the same could be said of him. Is he a man that he should change his mind? <laughs> to read right on Paul from his earliest published work from the late 1970s to the present is to witness a strikingly consistent explication of 
of an elegantly coherent account of Paulinism. One might ask, and some, uh, including myself, have asked how satisfactorily this elegant account fits with the sometimes rough contours of the primary text, but one cannot fault right for sloppy thinking. Do bishops have vices? I don't know. Uh, if they do, then incoherence is not one of Professor Rice. <laughs> Even so, uh, in this book, which really covers virtually all, nay, really all, the major cruces in Pauline interpretation, Wright does record a number of changes of mind on particular points. Most interesting to me, at least, he gives a significantly different account of the way in which the messiahship of Jesus relates to the Pauline trope of participation in Christ. Uh, then he offered in a classic 1991 essay on that topic. Uh, for other fascinating instances of interpretive repentance, uh, well, take up and read. More important than any such particular changes of mind, this book records the author's explication of Paul's thought in response to a very different set of questions than those that have preoccupied him before. The ground has shifted under us. When Wright made his major early contributions in Pauline studies in the 1980s and 1990s, the scholarly discussion <clears throat> was very much concerned with the so-called new perspective on Paul, with which the name of N.T. Wright will always be closely associated. In that context, quite appropriately, Wright was interacting closely with the likes of Christer Stendhal, E.P. Sanders, and James Dunn, although, to be sure, not only with them. Uh, I noted recently the names of Morna Hooker, Ralph Martin, and Heike Raisinen, for instance, are equally prominent in the footnotes of the Climax of the Covenant. Now, with the passage of time, the new perspective has both, on the one hand, established certain conclusions that have become new points of departure, and also, on the other hand, revealed itself to be, in fact, a miscellany of perspectives that have given birth to still other, newer perspectives. The field of Pauline studies has broadened outward, witnessing vigorous discussion on a number of very different fronts. And in this book, much to his credit, Wright engages closely with a remarkable number of them. The footnotes now are filled with detailed interaction with Edward Adams on cosmology, John Barclay on Roman imperial propaganda, Douglas Campbell on universalism, Charles Engler Peterson on Stoic physics, David Horrell on communal purity, Robert Jewett on the cursus honorum, J. Lewis Martin on supersessionism, Udo Schneller on moral formation, and Thomas Schreiner on justification, to name just a few. Wright's core understanding of Pauline theology remains basically unchanged from his earlier major treatments, or so it seems to me. But the account that he gives here is much fuller orbed, and not just in the sense that it contains more pages or further detail, but in the sense that it thinks along with Paul in response to questions that Wright himself had perhaps not yet considered in those earlier treatments. If I were to single out for comment one point on which I struggle to be convinced by Wright's argument, it would have to do with his appeal to the putative storied worldview within which Paul lives and moves and writes his letters. So for Wright, because Paul was a creational monotheist, he will have thought about X in such and such a way. Or because Paul, after his revelation, was a messianic monotheist, he will have thought about Y in such and such a way. This notion of a storied worldview, reconstructed from the Pauline texts themselves, as well as the Jewish scriptures and other Jewish texts roughly contemporary with Paul, does some significant heavy lifting for Wright, especially when, as often happens in the Pauline corpus, an interpretive aporia rears its ugly head. This is not to say that Wright skimps on detailed arguments from particular texts. He certainly does not do. But his readings of those primary texts are always and everywhere intertwined with his reconstruction of Second Temple Jewish creational monotheism. Now, I am broadly sympathetic to Wright's premise that there are such things as grand stories within which people picture themselves living and that this model 
maybe has a special uh, uh, appropriateness to Judaism in the Hellenistic and Roman periods. But the particular biblical story that Reich reconstructs is so artfully told that I wonder whether, in some instances, it forecloses certain possibilities for Paul. In some instances, possibilities that I think Paul may have, in fact, actualized. Sometimes, whilst reading Paul and the Faithfulness of God, I found myself reminded of E.P. Sanders' comments uh, about W.D. Davies' book on Paul, that some of the conclusions Davies thinks obviously followed from Paul's premises, Paul seems not, in fact, to have drawn. There is a potential difficulty that, on Wright's account, the story thinks Paul's thoughts for him. Now, this objection will not come as news to Professor Wright. He and I have discussed it in other settings, and he has addressed it directly in some of his earlier treatments. The whole issue has to do, as I think he himself notes somewhere in this book, with the age-old quarrel between Plato and Aristotle, whether it is more excellent to reason inward from general principles or outward from particular data. There's not one simple answer to that question, but there are certain good habits of thought that interpreters can cultivate and on the basis of which they can enjoy productive exchange and sometimes even, mirabile dictu, consensus. In this connection, and on our way to a conclusion, it may be fitting to quote a few words from the author himself. In a lively discussion of one very controversial passage, deep in part three of the book, Professor Wright writes as follows. To those who comment, but you're a bishop, so presumably you take a Christian view. I reply, yes, but the Christian view I take, in my tradition at least, is to let the text be the text rather than make it say what we want. If it turns out that Paul says things I do not want to hear, I shall live with it. If it turns out that I say things which Paul doesn't want to hear, perhaps he will one day put me straight. <laughs> if it turns out that Paul says things the 21st century doesn't want to hear, well, it's better that we get that out in the open rather than falsifying the historical evidence to fit our predilections. End quote. This is actually an excellent summary of the task of biblical exegesis, an ancient art of which Professor Wright is one of our ablest modern practitioners. In this book, we have his definitive treatment of, one of, of the most important apostolic writer. Wright's argument convinces at many, many points. And for those points at which it does not convince, he has accurately identified the grounds on which counterarguments will henceforth have to be mounted. This is a tremendous accomplishment, one for which I am, and I think all his readers will be, very grateful. Thank you, Professor Wright.